Oh, fantastic. Well, welcome everyone to the pop-up lecture series. This is our September version and we are so blessed to have Sally Cabot Gunning with us. First, I'll let you know that I'm Ellen Briggs, founder and president of Protect Our Past. We are a nonprofit based in Chatham with a mission to protect historic properties on the Cape and Islands uh, with, through media and advocacy. So this is, a, in other words, we need you. So anybody's interested, we're going to have a lot of fun. So hopefully you'll, you'll connect more with Protect Our Past. But tonight we kick off our fall season of series with, again, our one of our favorite authors, Sally Habit Gunning. And I would have to say she's one of the favorites because she's totally immersed into the uh, wonders of history and, and teaches us so much through her books. She's the author of six critically acclaimed historically themed novels, The Widow's War, which I just finished today, at Bound, The Rebellion of, hey, and the Rebellion of Jane Clark, Benjamin Franklin's Bastard, Monticello, a daughter's, and her, it's about her daughter and her father, and their latest novel is just released, <laughs> you can see it behind her, it was released in June, Painting the Light. Elected fellow of the Massachusetts Historic <laughs> Society, and president of Brewster Historical Society, Sally has created numerous historic tours in this charming village of Brewster, and I'm going to take advantage of that. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Daily Beast, Lit Hub, and an assortment of short stories anthologies. And Sally lives in Brewster with her husband. After she finishes, she will entertain your questions. So please feel free to use the chat room to, uh, to write your questions for Sally as they come to your mind. We won't get them to the end, to them to the end but feel free to start typing up your questions. Um, and this lecture is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the YouTube channel, Protect Our Past, in just a few days. So would you please, and it looks like most of you have, mute yourself so we can hear Sally. And Sally, we are ready. Take it away. Thank you so much, Ellen. And please forgive me because every time I clear my throat, it's going to come out in the microphone and I'm terribly allergic. So just pay attention to the rest of me and not my voice, <laughs> my clearing my throat part of my voice anyway. Um, <clears throat> so, see, there you go. <laughs> Excuse me. So I am going to put up a slideshow here and I'm going to start talking about some of the houses that have inspired my historical fiction as we go along. Uh, people often ask me, where do your ideas come from? And probably nine times out of 10, I can answer they come out of the ground. And particularly with my first historical novel, The Widow's War, uh, if those of you who are familiar, familiar with Brewster would relate to this statement, but when you walk around Brewster, the history is still here as it is with so many towns on the Cape. And now I'm gonna pull up uh, a, a shared screen. And I'm gonna talk about each of the properties that really have been preserved by either public or private means. And because they were preserved and because they were here, I was able to tap into a visual inspiration for writing these six historical novels. Uh, <clears throat> this all began long before the historical novels. Actually, I used to write mystery novels for Simon and Schuster. And in the process, uh, I found myself so wrapped up in the local history that I started cramming it into the books one by one. And I had a contract for a book a year with Simon and Schuster. And when I got to the 11th book, I kind of looked at myself in the mirror and I said, is this really what you want to be doing for the rest of your life? What about all these wonderful histories you've uncovered as you've walked around the Cape and done some research just for your own entertainment? And I said, okay, I'm going to take a break from this contract and I'm going to write an historical novel about this woman who really struck my fancy. And this was Liddy Berry. And one of the things that I loved about Liddy Berry is she existed in the 1700s. And I'm going to say backing up a lot because this is how I talk. Backing up, Liddy Berry did not exist. She's a composite of women who had her situation in life 
in the real world in the 1700s, but I glommed them all together in someone named Liddy Berry. So she's a construct of my own um, imagination. But uh, I really was determined very early on that I wanted to write about the 1700s because so many authors would write about the pilgrims or the clipper ship captains and skip right over the 1700s. And to me, they were fascinating. And particularly they were fascinating in Brewster, which was actually at the time part of Harwich, which confuses all of us because I call it something else again. I call it Setucket. In 1694, the papers of incorporation for the town of Harwich read, we incorporate the lands known as the Setucket lands from sea to sea into the town of Harwich. And then in 1803, when Brewster broke off from Harwich, they absolutely should have been called Setucket it, the town should have been called Setucket, but it wasn't. So I'm correcting that wrong. And sometimes I get to do that being a fiction writer. So I call uh, Brewster or Harwich or whatever it used to be. I call it Setucket because that was really the name for this part of what was then Harwich. So anyway, walking around this little part of Brewster, I would see these houses. And this one in particular was built in 1700 by Joseph Snow. And it's the classic example of a Cape Cod house. It's got the central chimney, the two doors on either, the, the do, central door, central chimney, the two windows on either side. It could very well have, it probably was actually a half house originally. And a half house would have two windows, the door, the chimney, and nothing on the other side. If you look really closely at this house, you'll notice that the two windows, I the left and right is screwed up here, but the window, these windows. <laughs> The, the smaller, you can see that two of the windows are smaller. And so very likely this house was a half house and the other half of it was added on at a later, later time as the family grew. So the fact that this house existed inspired me. I knew this, this was where Liddy would live. I was so enamored of the Cape Cod house in and of itself. There's a wonderful book out there by Dara Stone called A Book of Cape Cod Houses. And she puts in the floor plan very simple. You'd have uh, two rooms in the front, a long keeping room in the back where most of the living went on. There'd be a birthing room. And up under the eaves, you'd stick all the kids without the heat and, and without much in the way of beds. They'd all be crammed in. So anytime you wanted a little light, you popped a window in on one of the gable ends. And uh, I remember when Thoreau wrote about walking the Cape, he talked about that. He said, for some reason, whenever they want a window, they just punch a hole in the side of their house and stick it willy nilly wherever they want it. And that was such a wonderful description of a Cape Cod house. I loved that. So I know this is where Liddy was gonna live. Now this house sits at 2042 Main Street in Brewster. And my character, Liddy Berry, I had already formulated in my mind was going to interact with the native peoples who were living in Brewster at that time. And in order for her to interact with the native peoples domestically, she needed to live somewhere else. So I talked to our local archeologist and he told me where Liddy should live. And this was off of Briar Lane in Brewster. And as luck would have it, there was another beautiful Cape Cod house right in the spot I wanted to put Liddy. And the only trouble was over the years, it had been added on, dormers had been put on, extensions, a huge barn attached to the house. And so it wasn't gonna be that visual that I really wanted. So this is the image I captured as Liddy's house. And I did move it, just so you know, I moved it. But in 1700, interestingly enough in Brewster, if you're familiar with Brewster, I don't know if you are, but uh, it's a pretty flat shoreline. We don't have what you would call a harbor, but in 1700, there were two landings, one was, uh, called Robin's Landing, which is today Saint's Landing. And the other was called Point of Rocks, which is today Point of Rocks. And those were the two major harbors in town and unbelievable levels of trade went on in those two harbors. And as I started reading about it, it changed my idea of this idyllic, peaceful little village. Things were happening here. It was busy, it was thriving. In the year 1765, for example, 12 whaling vessels left from Brewster and set sail up and down the coast. 
in their version of whaling, which wasn't like a four year whaling voyage, which we think of with the later years of the uh, shipmasters, they would uh, catch a whale, pull into shore, cut up, cut up the blubber, stick it in barrels, pull into shore, try it up, put the oil back in the barrels and go a little further down shore. And, you know, they called it inshore whaling and it was uh, very prominent in Brewster. Sometimes they did it another way. We have the Brewster Flats and Brewster and whales would often strand on the Brewster Flats. And with a little help, as if wherever possible, we drove them on shore. And this is how my first historical novel, The Widow's War, begins with the townspeople driving the whales ashore and harvesting the blubber. And how they did that, they set up the tripods along the beach and they fried it up. And you can imagine what that town smelled like on the day when they were boiling down whale oil right along the shore. So all these sights and sounds and smells get into my novel because I've read about them, but I have a visual, I have that house. And that's the hearth and the home and the house is very important to Lee Berry and it's the motivating factor in much of what happens in the book. And to me, it was just so special to be able, anytime I wanted you to walk or drive by that house, and picture her sitting in the corner in there. Speaking of her sitting in the corner in there, uh, the premise of the book is uh, something I didn't know about until I read an old family will. It's called The Widow's Thirds. And in colonial Massachusetts, the law of the land was that if your husband died, you were entitled to one third life use of his real estate or the comparable financial settlement to that um, amount of the property. So I wasn't very happy about this widow's thirds. I thought one third, and there were many cases of wills where widows are being allowed to sit in this part of the house and use this part of the hearth and hang their laundry on these bushes and put their cow in this field. And the son or son or son-in-law is sitting in the other, the rest of the house and all the widow's belongings that she took with her to her marriage very often came back to her in her husband's will and she has to cram them all into one third of that house. And this intrigued me that uh, how, the, how this would work out in a family when this was going on. And I found a couple of instances where I had a feeling there might've been a little issue. I found in, in the Boston Public Library, they have all the old Boston gazettes and I would sit down in front of the microfiche and flip through and read all the advertisements. And I found an advertisement for a fellow who wanted to sell two thirds of his house. And I saw that advertisement and I knew who was sitting in that other third. It was my Liddy Barry. She was gonna sit there and not move. So that was a justification for where I was going with this novel. And there were cases of women who were given a, a large financial settlement in lieu of their thirds. In my own family, my ancestor wrote in his will, in lieu of her thirds, I give my wife this, that, and the other. And there were women who didn't care about the financial. They wanted their house. And so they would squat in that third of the house. They, they could have a choice. They could take the, this was called common law in Massachusetts. They could take their common law third of the house or they could take the will settlement, whichever they preferred. And there were women who just said, you're not kicking me out of this house too bad, I'm sitting here, deal with it. So Liddy Berry had a lot of historical precedent to operate on. And again, you can picture her after I've told you all that, just perched in her little corner of that house and not moving. And that's a lot of the premise of what goes on in the Widow's War. So now we're gonna move up a book. Oh, excuse me, no, we're still with the Widow's War. This is the Dillingham house. Uh, this house was built in 1660. And it's called a salt box style. And it's called that because it's shaped like an old container of salt. Salt boxes were shaped like this with a little flip up lid in the, in the front. I keep pointing to the screen and I realize you can't see what I'm pointing at. But anyway, um, so this was a very other, another popular style of a house. And it was always faced south if it possibly could be because you'd take, get maximum benefit of all the south sun, the long sloping back face north, it fought off the wind, it let the snow slide off in the winter. And particularly here sitting on Cape Cod Bay, you can imagine that was a very helpful um, um, layout for them to have. 
And you can see that it's bigger. This house belonged to John Dillingham. He was the most wealthy uh, resident in Setucket uh, in 1660. And it showed because of the size of his house. He was a Quaker and he followed his friend John Wing here in Brewster. We were pretty nice to the Quakers. There was a um, town meeting record where we had voted to um, excuse the Quakers their um, bounty on, you know, we were like during the French and Indian Wars, for example, we would be charged to supply the troops with money and they exempted the Quakers from that military tax because of their peaceable principles. So there weren't a whole lot of towns that did that. So Brewster attracted uh, some Quakers in those very, very early days. And this house sits right next to where John Wing sat. And if you're familiar with Brewster, again, Wing Island was um, John Wing's land. It's not sure that he ever actually lived on the island, it's doubtful. But these two uh, fellows lived next door and they were good friends and Quaker meetings were held in this house. And in my book, I talk about the other side of this issue with the Quakers because not everybody was fond of the Quakers. Now, if you can imagine when a Quaker is exempted the tax, the rest of the tax gets divvied up amongst a smaller pool. So there were people who could factor that in and not be too happy about that. So my character calls um, Nathan Clark, who Nathan Clark, the character is in my book that is trying to fight Liddy for the house. He talks about the Dillinghams as the damned Quakers. So this is the house where the damned Quaker lived. Now we're going to the next book. Uh, I will just explain a little bit that the Widow's War, Bound, and the Rebellion of Jane Clark are a trilogy. And Ellen has already confessed that she read them in the wrong order. I'll forgive her. But I'm so anal. I really want you to start at the beginning if you haven't read them yet. And that's The Widow's War, then Bound, then The Rebellion of Jane Clark. This is the State House in Boston, the old State House. And I use this as another wonderful example of a restored house. And I'm gonna back up again a little bit here. The two houses I've showed you previously have been kept in their close to original condition by private individuals who purchased them and decided to maintain them with some help from the historic district that we have in place in Brewster. You don't get to do stuff to a house that you might want to do. But just think about that for one minute. If that weren't in place, what those houses might look like, as opposed to what I just showed you that they look like. So another example of wonderful historic preservation is this old state house in Boston. You can see by the ironic setting, it's this small building sitting in between all these skyscrapers. But when you get there, and you're on the street, you don't see those skyscrapers. You forget that they're there. And my second novel, Bound, trans, uh, trans, you know, goes back and forth between Boston and Brewster quite a bit. And the catalyst in that book is the stamp tax and the stamp tax riots, the Stamp Act riots. And a lot of these activities were taking, on, taking place around the old state house in Boston. And James Otis was a key player. He lived in Barnstable. His statue is in front of the courthouse as is the statue of his sister, Mercy Otis Warren in front of the courthouse, which has also been beautifully preserved, the courthouse. And he stood in this building that you're looking at in 1761. And he declared a man's right to his life, liberty and property. You may have heard those phrases before. And also that women should be educated and given the right to vote and that slavery should be abolished. This is 1761. So this building has a um, important place in my heart because of the ideas that were first espoused there that really had a lot to do with um, what we ended up as a country, or I will paraphrase that, what we are trying hard to end up as, as a country. And this is the old grist mill in Brewster. And this particular building dates to 1873. It's owned by the town of Brewster and they have maintained it and they've worked very hard to, this, this picture is actually a little bit old. It's from, um, I pulled it off my website and it's not, it's actually, there's been some restoration that has gone on since this picture, but the old water wheel has been rebuilt. Um, 
the, the um, grindstone inside has been preserved. It actually grinds corn. On Saturdays in the summer, you can go there and watch them grind the corn and then buy a bag of the cornmeal. And it's a pretty nifty little place. In my third uh, novel in the Setucket series, The Rebellion of Jane Clark, she lives on the hill just above this grist mill and her father owns the mill. And across the way, the winds, her family, they're the Clarks. And across the way, the Winslows have a house and they own shares in the mill. They, this building that you're looking at right now <clears throat> was actually Winslow's fulling mill in the 1700s where they would uh, use a soapy kind of an herb and beat the lanolin out of the wool, wool and tighten it up to make it a tighter weave for clothing. And that's what the mill that was sitting on the site where this one is today was doing. Diagonally across the road was the actual grist mill that was owned by Clark, who was my character in the book, who didn't like those damn Quakers. And over the course of many decades and many generations, Winslow and Clark sued each other over the rights to the mill stream. I went into the mass archives and in five seconds, I found 30 cases of lawsuits of Winslow versus Clark. But what got me going on the novel, <clears throat> The Rebellion of Jane Clark, was one of those cases was uh, tried by John Adams. He was down here defending Clark in one of those lawsuits. He was charging Winslow with impeding the uh, flow of the herring in spring. And this was against the law. And he won his lawsuit and of course, John Adams. But the, the violence and the antipathy between these two families went on generation after generation after generation. We know it ended eventually because I'm descended from both those families. So somewhere on the, along the line, they started speaking pleasantly to each other and a few other things. But in the rebellion of Jane Clark, Jane lives not very far from this mill. And a lot of the early action in the book describes what's going on in the mill, the herring um, being caught and barreled and sent off to feed the slaves in the West Indies, which is what they were doing with them. And she is in a situation where she could stay or she could go. And she defies her father and ends up leaving and going to Boston and gets involved in much of the politics there and then brings a lot of that back home. But a lot of the uh, conflict in this book resolves, revolves around this mill stream. Winslow had a beautiful black horse, this is factual, and some Clark cut off its ears to get back at Winslow and when things weren't going quite their way in the lawsuit. So Jane's task in life is to figure out if my father did something like this, how do I, how do I think about him now? This man that I have loved, how do I think about a man who would do something like that? So a lot of this book is her internal struggle and part of the metaphor to all that, of course, are the herring that are running upstream against the current, going downstream with the current, depending on what time of year it is. And Jane is having to figure out where her place is and what her course is going to be upstream or downstream. So, so there's another wonderful visual and there is a beautiful museum upstairs in the grist mill, but more to the point, I think for my book really was the beautiful grounds around this mill. It's a beautiful um, park today preserved, preserved by the town of Brewster. Um, that being said, I will just say one thing about that. This was native people's land. And when the last native American died, she was being kept, I wanna say um, in town, a poor person was farmed out to the lowest bidder for their care and the town foot the bill. And so when she died, there was an outstanding debt and they took the land, this remaining land to pay that debt. So think of that how you will, but the wonderful thing about the land that you see here is you know perfectly well that there were native peoples uh, camped there through time. And uh, it adds to the historic feel of history coming up through the ground to me and all that got into my novels too. <clears throat> After the rebellion of Jane Clark, I moved out. 
um, Benjamin Franklin stuck his big nose into the business. People forget that he wasn't a Philadelphia boy. He was actually born in Boston and uh, his mother was from Nantucket and he was an indentured servant. His mother was an indentured servant. His father bought his mother out of indentured servitude to marry her. And uh, a lot of this got incorporated into the previous novel, Bound, because that was about an indentured servant. So as I'm researching indentured servants and I'm coming across Benjamin Franklin, I find out a few more interesting things about him. He had an illegitimate child and nobody knew who the mother was. So having come out of the mystery writer's school of thought, I figured I can solve that mystery. And I set out with the ben Benjamin Franklin's bastard to try to solve that mystery. And the picture you're looking at here, it's a little street in Philadelphia called Elfrith's Alley. And as you can see, this has been beautifully restored. And so this is one instance where you have to sort of not think about what you're looking at when you're reading Benjamin Franklin's Bastard because the woman who uh, gave birth to this illegitimate child lived in a poverty stricken alley that would not have looked like this with beautifully painted red doors and red shutters and flowers growing on the windowsill and so forth and so on. But if you look closely, you can see there's sort of a gutter down the middle of the street. And that's where all the raw sewage ran. That's where you emptied your chamber pot in the morning when you got up. So even though this street had been really gentrified, I could go there and I could identify the cramped quarters. I could identify the poverty that was around her at the time with just a little stretch of the imagination and a lot of reading, a lot of research. So this was a, um, a fun uh, slide to include, uh, include here just for that very reason that this is one where what you're looking at isn't what you are gonna be thinking about when you're writing the book. You have, to, you have to adapt it a little bit as you go. And of course that happens many times in many places. So moving on from Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin led me to Thomas Jefferson. I was finished with Benjamin Franklin just as he was setting sail for France. And who's in France but Thomas Jefferson and his 14 year old daughter. And she was uh, living in a convent outside of Paris and writing letters to her father. And in one of her letters, she wrote, uh, I wish with all my heart the Negroes were freed. It hurts my heart how they're treated by our fellow countrymen. And so I wanted to give Martha a book just on the basis of that statement alone. And I started to read a lot about Martha and her father and they wrote a lot of letters back and forth. I read a lot of letters. So uh, it's the story about Martha and her father and their relationship. But as I was researching this book, as I was writing this book, I visited Monticello in every season. It's not much colder than that mountain in January. I just want you to know that Virginia notwithstanding, it is cold up there. And as I started researching Martha and her father, I realized that this house of all the houses I've been writing about is probably the most influential in everything that happened in their lives and in every aspect of their lives, their financial life, their family life, the slavery, it all had to do with this physical building that you're looking at right now, Monticello. Thomas Jefferson poured his heart and soul into that building. Martha poured her heart and soul into that building. She was willing to move back into that building at the expense of her happy marriage in an effort to help her father keep that building. And as I wrote and experienced Monticello, it became a real character in the book, more so really than many of the other houses that I have been writing about. Mon when Jefferson died, he was in poverty. He had no money. He, everything he owned was hawked, including all of his slaves, including Monticello. Uh, the family lost Monticello. And it was only many years later that someone came along who felt it was of enough importance to restore it to its original glory. And this gentleman's name was Levi and he did a wonderful job. Since that time, the Monticello Association has stepped in and they have continued to maintain this property beautifully. I talk about this book and this house and this story so many times because this to me is the proof that history isn't static. 
when I first toured Monticello, you didn't hear the word slave. Everything that Jefferson had spent his life doing was to try to deny the existence of slavery. You couldn't sleep, see the slave quarters from the house. Everything was below ground. He didn't want to have um, that staring in his face every day, this terrible institution that he was trying to uh, ignore and work around as best he could. And when I went there the last time, they've got a slavery tour. They've, they're starting to make a, they're, they've uncovered the room where Sally Hemings lived. Uh, and if there's anyone who's been under a rock for a very long time, they might not know, but Sally Hemings was um, his enslaved concubine is how her family describes it. And uh, she had a room under the house and uh, they've restored that and they've started to make a whole exhibit about her. Uh, when they started doing that, I wrote an op-ed piece for the Washington Post called A Room of Her Own. And I was taking the point of view that it's time we gave Sally some other adjectives despite, despite the world, words concubine and slave. She was a very strong woman. If you think about it, she was 16 years old and she negotiated with the most one of the most powerful men in the world uh, for rights that were not ever given to slaves. She had very little um, to do of the life of a slave by virtue of him promising her she wouldn't have to. She bargained for the freedom for all her children and she held that man to his promises for a long time, many decades. And this is someone that you need to reckon with. This isn't just a nameless slave or a nameless concubine. This was someone who had um, some agency and uh, affected quite a bit of what happened at Monticello. And part of what I wrote about is the story of the father and the daughter, but it's also the story of Sally and how the daughter and the father uh, deal with that reality in the face of the fantasy that they're trying to create. Because what you're looking at is the fantasy that they tried to create of this beautiful world on top of a mountain with nothing ugly going on anywhere around it. So this was very uh, <clears throat> significant to me that Monticello has been so beautifully restored and that the history is being told honestly. And this doesn't always happen. And the longer you live, the more honest it gets, I hope. This is my hope. So I have one more picture to show you here. This is the Hemings family slave cabin. And what a juxtaposition is this? You look at Monticello and you look at this and the square hole that you see in the floor is where they hid their few valuables so that nobody could steal them. It would ordinarily have a cover over it. This is the entire house that the Hemings family lived in. The nuclear unit, not Sally because she was living underneath Monticello but the initial nuclear unit would be in this house. This is the entire house. And what you're looking at are probably all their possessions in the world. And these are probably more possessions than most other slaves have because Jefferson gave the Hemings family special consideration in all his dealings. And now we're coming back to the book that I'm supposed to be here trying to sell to you, Painting the Light, which is right behind me in the corner there. Um, but that's not why I'm doing this particular program. I'm doing this to support protect our past. But this is the Allen Farm on Martha's Vineyard. And Painting the Light came about pretty much because of this building you're looking at right there, this farm. Every year, my husband and I try to go to Martha's Vineyard and celebrate our anniversary. And we don't always get there, but we got there enough times. And every time we did, we'd drive around the island. And this farm is in Sh um, Ch Chilmark. It's, it was built in the 18th century. It's the Allen Farm. And it looks out over water on both sides. And on both sides, there are sheep dotting the hills. And I kept saying to my husband, Tom, as I drove by every time, I need to set a book there. It's so perfect. But I never had the story to go with it. But this house demanded its feature in one of my novels. And <clears throat> finally, Many years later, I was actually, usually when I finish a book, as I was describing how Benjamin Franklin led, led me to Thomas Jefferson and on and on and on, one book will lead into the other book. But when I got through with Jefferson, 
one of his daughters had moved to Boston and I followed her to Boston thinking that would be an interesting story. So I got back north and I got reading about um, abolition because that was the next step in the chronology that I was in in 1831. Then I went to 1841 and so forth. And that's when abolition kind of really kicked in. So I got involved in reading about Boston, the abolitionists, and lo and behold, I ended up with the suffragists who came out of the abolition movement. And as I started reading about these strong women in Boston around the turn of the last century, 1898 is the year I picked because a lot of other historical things went on on Martha's Vineyard then, uh, I started running into the artists. And this was just when the women artists started coming into their own and critical success, financial success. And it wasn't easy for them to do that. It was quite a haul. And it was fascinating to me how that happened and what courage it took to bust through that male-centric world of theirs. And I decided that I was going to set my book on Martha's Vineyard. I'd found one of these women artists had gone to the vineyard and was teaching in this what was then called the Martha's Vineyard Institute. And it was the first summer, summer institute, teacher's institute in the country. And so I got my artist in and lo and behold, I got my suffragists in and they all sat around on this beautiful farmhouse and I got my sheep in and I learned a whole heck of a lot of stuff about sheep while I was writing this book. So you can see where the influences came from directly through the air to me. And it's so important that we do preserve these historic properties, not just so that I get to write a book out of it, but here's one more property I'm gonna mention briefly and then I'm gonna open it up to questions and comments. I think I've been gabbing on here a long time. This is the Elijah Cobb house in Brewster and this is the home of the Brewster Historical Society. And this house was built in 1799 and it stayed in the Cobb family until 1941. And when it was sold in 1941, the fellow who bought it was a name artist from the museum of, um, uh, his work has appeared in the um, Fine Arts Museum in Boston. And he was very interested in restoring the property to um, its old glory. And uh, because it had been quite run down by the time the family finished with it, they still had outhouses out back, no plumbing. Um, it was pretty raw. So then when he finally sold the house, the next person who bought it also wanted to continue this restoration. They removed an L that had been added later on to the property. And they did throw in a galley kitchen, a bathroom and a laundry room and various things like that. But when the house fell on hard times yet again, the Brewster Historical Society came along and we launched a capital campaign of which I'm very proud. And we purchased and restored the property and opened it to the public in 2016. And in this house, there's a, there are four rooms that have been pretty much unchanged since 1799 and portions of the keeping room. Uh, we removed the galley kitchen, we removed the French doors and a few things like that. And this is, we're very proud of this. It's a wonderful museum. And it's just a point of pride to us that we finally have, the Brewster's known as the Sea Captain's Town. And it's a point of pride to us that we now have a Sea Captain's Home open to the public. So I hope you come by and see it sometime. So on that note, I'm gonna shut up and I'm gonna look for questions and comments and I'm happy to answer, respond, whatever you've got. Wow, Sally, that was just so interesting. I've made notes. I'm going to have to go see these houses. I can see Lydia in the corner and the cow out in the back. And I'm just, it was totally wonderful to live your books through you, through the author, through your mind and, and the messages that they send, which is very sobering for us to learn um, how through history, our, our rights as women, all of the, the slave issues, all of these other issues you address um, evolved. So uh, I am certainly very grateful, but let's open up for some questions. Um, I have some, but I don't think I ought to wait for mine to come last. Ellen, excuse yes. me. It might be that the chat is not visible for everyone. Uh, because of the screen sharing. You and I can see it because of our privileges. I'm not sure everyone else can. And that is where each of us can type in a question. Let's see. I'll, stop, I'll stop the share. So now you can. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. 
Well, uh, while you're all thinking of your questions, uh, I'm going to start with, uh, I'm sure everybody's thinking, okay, we're back in the late 1898, late 1800s, early 1900s. What's next? <laughs> That's the deadly question. Um, I have had the interesting thing happen where my first three historical novels were optioned for film. And um, she's, she's somebody with street cred in Hollywood. She's already won an Oscar and she's got a couple of nominations for Emmys and so forth. And uh, she came flying out from LA a little while ago to um, visit Liddy's world. And you can't imagine how thrilled I was to um, be able to show her physical things that had been preserved in Brewster for her to look at as she imagines how she would stage this film. And this doesn't mean there's gonna be a movie, you know, many things, many times an option takes place and nothing ever happens, but that's what's happening. So talking to this woman, she got me all fired up again about that original, mm -hmm. she, she, she optioned the three books, um, The Widow's War Bound and The Rebellion of Jane Clark. And her plan is to try to offer a series for Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, something like that, each a book a year and uh, a book season. So I got thinking about those books again and I had always had in my mind the fourth book I wanted to write and got kidnapped by Benjamin Franklin. He distracted me from the whole idea. And so I'm really thinking I might go back and write that fourth book in that series and, and tap back into Liddy Berry and her, um, the family each one of those books in the series has a different protagonist and the, the um, sibling that has not yet had one is Bethia Clark and I would like to give her a book. So I'm thinking oh. of that as the next one. That sounds, I'm so glad you're going back uh, in, in history because I have learned so much. I thought I knew some, but the more every time I read your books and the descriptions and I wanna compliment you on your ability to to express what we're seeing so well, so vividly. So I feel like I'm living it and I'm learning. So I'm so grateful you're going back so I can live and learn some more, especially on the Cape and Islands. Um, I see a, a question from uh, Darla uh, Thang. I'm not sure I pronounced your last name right. So T-H-Y-N-G. And she said, Do you, did you know your book Bound was going to be such an in-depth look into the effect of trauma on a person's psyche. I came to Bound when I was writing, when I was researching The Widow's War, I came upon uh, this wonderful diary written by a fellow named Benjamin Bangs. And he talked about mm -hmm. visiting a former indentured servant who'd been thrown into jail for the crime of infanticide because this was not uncommon. If a single woman gave birth to a child while she was alone and the child died, they accused her of killing it to hide her sin of fornication. And um, this was a case that this young woman was thrown into Barnstable jail and sat there for a good long time while she waited for her trial to come up on the circuit court. And um, I won't tell you the outcome because I want you to read the book, but I was able to find in the Massachusetts archives, all the documents, the witness statements, the jury verdict, the, um, um, what do you call it, the indictment, the um, warrant for her, this young girl's arrest and everything. And so again, everything was just so alive and real to me. And that was all I had to go on. But as I delved into the book, I, I read a lot more about, I researched indentured servitude and I had known much, uh, I knew a lot more about slavery than I did about indentured servitude. And I was horrified to find out how um, horrible indentured servitude was. And I mean, it was just unbelievable. And the ways that you could be kept in indentured servitude forever and the cheating and the lying and the, all the things that people did to try to enslave, essentially enslave someone under this legal system uh, that brought a lot of people to Massachusetts in the early days. And so the minute I dropped down inside that young woman's head, then, it started to open up, not when I thought I was gonna write the book, not you know, in the early days, but as I went along, I said, this is what's gonna to happen to her. And now what's gonna to happen to her? And now how is she gonna respond? And I think the thing that uh, surprised me, I sound silly when I say that, but as a writer, one thing that surprised me was um, there was a level of delusion 
in there and how comfortable that felt that you could delude yourself that this mm -hmm. none of this was really happening and um i explored that at length and that was interesting to me a new thing for me uh some more questions from uh marin carlson she said how did you get interested in history well i think i'm going to take this back to college i i took some, I didn't major in history, but I took some courses that were fascinating. And for a summer job, I served as a tour guide in the Drummer Boy Museum. Again, if you know Brewster, there's the Drummer Boy Park. That used to be a museum that told the story of the American Revolution, uh, but the real story. The fellow who set up that place was a Washington lawyer, and he decided that we're going to tell it the way it really was. In other words, Paul Revere didn't finish his ride. You know, there are things, <laughs> there are things. And so he, we, I was a tour guide in that museum for all my college summers. And he was an interesting guy. He'd hand me all the books and the research materials and say, oh, you've got to read this book by, um, blanking on her name, Paul Revere in the world who lived to Esther Forbes. Oh. And I read that book and I was smelling the fish on the wharf. I was, you know, it was all coming alive to me. And then I'm coming across these little stories that I, started branching out. I'm reading diaries. I'm reading women's journals. And I'm saying, these are the stories that aren't out there. These are the small, quiet stories that no one's telling. And these are the small, quiet stories I want to tell. Just for example, about the widow's thirds. I didn't know about the widow's thirds. So I'm assuming other people don't know about the widow's thirds. And we should. So I'm going to write a book about the widow's thirds and that kind of thing. So each time I came to a question, it sparked another little bit of reading and I was into my up to my neck after a while. There was no getting out. <laughs> Another uh, uh, Caroline has asked. There are two here. Uh, when you write a book, do you start at the beginning and stay in order, or do you jump around? And she follows that with, "Do you do all your research first? Do you know where your storyline storyline will go before you start writing?" When I was writing mystery novels for Simon and Schuster and I had the one book a year contract, the deal was I would submit a not about 10 page proposal outline, whatever you want to call it, of the story beginning to end, who did it, why they did it, where the clues are that tell you who did it. And I did that for 10 books. And when I started thinking about doing my widow's war, I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to open the door on Liddy sitting in her corner and see where she takes me. And that's, there's a word for that. It's called character-driven fiction. And you get inside the head of a character and you let them wander where they will. And so that's how I wrote The Widow's War. I had no idea how it was gonna end up. As a matter of fact, I started the book with her getting burned. And then in the final version, she gets burned a lot later in the story uh, in a much better place, <laughs> better place to get burned. Um, and I did not know where it was going. Now, of course, then I become the victim of my success because that book was sold and they wanted another one. And Harper Collins now, and same thing, submit your proposal. And then they pay you to write the book. The Widow's Award, nobody paid me to write that. I just took a chance and wrote it and sent it out and see, you know, saw if somebody would um, sell it. With all the mystery novels, they paid me half the money up front. Then I write the book send in the manuscript, they pay me the other half of the money. And that was the way with all the other, with Bound and the Rebellion of Jane Clark. But what happened with Rebellion of Jane Clark was I got um, ill with rheumatoid arthritis and I had a lot of trouble meeting my deadline. It was very difficult to work at the computer. And um, when I decided to write a book after that one, Benjamin Franklin's Bastard, I said, I'm not doing a contract again. I don't want a deadline. I want to just write it and have it done when I'm done. So um, again, I didn't have to plot it out. I could sit down and that book, interestingly, I started it where it ended up ending. And then when it got as far as an editor, she said, you know, you're giving away all your secrets up front. Let's do this a little differently. So I went back and, you know, so you have a little more work if you don't plot it out, plot it out step by step, you make a little work for yourself. You paint yourself into the corners. But in my personal opinion, the characters are stronger. Um, I'm very proud to have received a lot of critical acclaim for my sense of place wherever I am and not having to rush through it 
being able to sit down and settle, being able to travel six times to Monticello and, you know, do all the things I want to do. It, I, to me, it makes a better book. Was that all the question? Was there something else I forget? Well, I, I can think of so many more. I'm just so enraptured by this. But I want to ask you a physical question. When I was reading um, about the jail, I kept thinking of the oldest wooden jailhouse in America on 6A in Bruce in Barnstable. Yes. Is that the jail? Is that was that the I, jail? Do you know? I went to visit that jail. Yes, it was. And I went to visit wow. it and it was so interesting. There were, yeah. there were, um, well, just, you know, for example, in that diary, I was telling you about that Benjamin Franklin's diary. He talks about Spaniards coming off a ship and I imagine they got drunk or something and they ended up getting thrown in jail. They were shipwrecked or something. I can't remember the details, but imagine this young girl in this jail with oh. these drunken Spaniards. I mean, you know, it, it was interesting to me, but then they had people who carved things into the wall of the jail, beautiful ships. And it, it was an interesting place. Very interesting. Yes. Anybody who's here and hasn't been to that, and I only just learned about it a few years ago, which I'm ashamed to say, but wow, the oldest wooden jailhouse in America is on 6A. It's been restored from the outside. The inside is original and fascinating. So be sure and go and visit that. I'm good. See, visiting history is so stimulating, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Can we can, what time is it? It's, it's almost seven o'clock. So it's been almost an hour. There is uh, another question though, that might be oh, interesting. Sorry. Check it out. Okay. Or, Do you know how much of the Bang character you have mentioned in your books? Brewster Bangs are in my family lineage. That's from Darla. Jonathan and Edward Bangs, I gather. And in mine too. Hello, cousin. Oh. <laughs> the, what you've got to read. And the original um, diary is in Massachusetts Historical Society custody. They have a typed transcript of it, which I worked off of, and I actually made my own um, um, digital transcript of it. And I gifted it to the Brewster Ladies Library and the Brewster Historical Society. And he started out in uh, 1742, keeping this diary, and it ran till 1765. And you captured him from his wild throat, sowing the young, sowing his young oats days to the responsible town father days and it's all in there and it was so interesting because this guy was one heck of a gossip so i got the history and i got the dirt and it was so much fun and he is the widow's war in particular would never have been as much fun as it was without that diary and he taught me so much about the 1700s that I had, you know, you all assume the Puritans are pure and forget, get over that as fast as you can, because that's not true. And he would talk about this racy stuff and I'd be reading it five times. I'd be saying, I can't be, this isn't true. Can I be reading this actually happened in the 1700s? And then the, the you know, the light bulb goes off. We didn't invent the thing. You know, it's, everybody's been doing the same thing forever and they will continue to do the same thing forever. But, um, you know, wives were moving out of their husbands and moving in with some other man and he talks about one woman hauling out the man's tackle at a quilting. And I'm going, whoa, <laughs> you know, wow. this is wild stuff. But he was very, very um, helpful. He had insight. He had a wonderful family life. He adored his wife. His biggest claim to fame was that he could make it to the midwife in an hour and seven minutes all the way to Harwich from wow. Bruce in an hour wow. and seven minutes, you know. Uh, every time she went into labor, he just suffered the throes of it himself. He was just riddled with anxiety and miserable the whole time. And, you know, he's a very interesting character. And um, he lived right in the center of town. And he married one of the Dillinghams who lived in the damn, Yank, damn Quaker's house that I showed you. And he would ride over at night to see her. And her grandmother sometimes wouldn't let him in because he came too late. So it was like, you know, I know what you're here for. That's forget it. I'll go back and come earlier next time. So he wrote about all this and it just brought everything so much to life. I owe him a huge debt of gratitude. Wow. Well, then thank you for that question. We've never heard all that. Um, this just end up with one other question about your painting. I understand that you 
like to paint? Are you still painting? I'd say painting the light. I'm just wondering if you're painting. When I was starting, to, when I was sitting down to write Painting the Light and I knew I was gonna feature an artist, I've always been interested in art. I used to do watercolor and my husband gave me a gift that December of art classes. And I took acrylic this time with Odin Smith up at the creative, no, Cape Cod Art Center in Barnstable. And uh, she was fantastic. She didn't mind that I walked in with a envelope full of pictures of sheep. She can handle that. She taught me to paint sheep. I've painted sheep. Oh. Hold on. Here, I'll show you one. Oh, oh, I love that. Very Thank nice. You. Very nice. So, so um, I, you know, as Ida was learning to paint the Martha's in your life, because the premise with my book is that Ida has come out of the Boston school and they were all portraitists and still life artists and mostly. And so she leaps into this impulsive marriage, lands on Martha's Vineyard and is trying to resurrect her career and has to learn how to paint landscapes. So, and sheep. So I, with Ida, along with Ida, I was learning how to paint landscapes and sheep. And so it was a lot of fun. And, um, it, you know, I, I hope to keep doing it. I. I haven't had time. I hate to say that, but I haven't had time. So I haven't done too much lately, but I'm hoping to get back to it. it was well, you've got time to get back to it. Congratulations on the, uh, the, the interest in, in producing films on your, your three books. Uh, that's, that's huge to have that opportunity before you. And, and I was hoping that was going to happen because we need good things on Netflix and get tired of the same old, same old. So I think it would be wonderful for your books to be filmed. So congratulations on that. And I just want to thank you. Oh my gosh, you know, we could go on. I could go on for hours. Yeah, Lucy's clapping, everybody clap, bravo. <laughs> well done. Um, you're just uh, just inspiring for many, many reasons. And I, and I am so pleased that you were able to be here for us on our Protector Pass lecture. And any of you who are here with us would like to become a member, just go to our website, protectourpass.org and you'll see that it's possible. Uh, the monies that we receive are put forth for our media and our, our advocacy program plans for saving historic properties on the Cape and Island, because as you may well know, we're watching too many disappear. I, see, I hear about Brewster and I think, yeah, that must be like a Mecca in the middle of what I'm experiencing all around. Uh, even Nantucket is, is having challenges and they the, wow. seem to be the most protected. So we need, uh, we need to follow through with our vision and any membership um, income will be very, very helpful or donations. So we appreciate that. And next month, I don't know, Sally, if you've heard of Duncan Berry, but he is a fifth generation um, of captains. He's not a captain now, but in, in West Harwich. And he's been working feverishly, diligently to save Captain's Row, which is on 28. And they're wonderful old captain's houses that have been neglected. And people are going to tear one down and put a dollar general there. And he stopped that. And he got the town behind it. So it's a, it'll be a very, very interesting to walk through uh, evening to walk through Captain's Row with Duncan Berry. And Sally, I, I would like to introduce you to him because I think you'll, you will, that, that may be another book, Duncan. There you go, yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. he is really, uh, he has a way with words. It just is very captivating. So I hope you all join us. That will be um, on Wednesday, October 13th at six o'clock. So uh, it's been a wonderful time with you, Sally. You're so gracious to give us of your time and your mind. And thank you all for joining us. And we hope to see you again next month. Meantime, go to protectourpast.org and, and get involved. Let me know, write me if you'd like to see how you would like to help us out with our mission. So have an enjoyable evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Bye Sally. Awesome job. Hi. Yeah, fantastic. I see people I know out there. Carol Dell. Oh. Hi. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks Thank for you coming. For... Absolutely. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Bye, Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca was on. Rebecca. Yes. Wait a minute, Rebecca. Good. Stay on. Rebecca, I'd like to talk, see you. Are you there? Is she there? She's still on. Rebecca, can you hear? Oh, there she you is. are. Whoops, sorry, you're muted. Didn't mean to mute you. Ask, ask to un unmute. You can. She can't. Yeah, no. Do you know her? I do. Mm -hmm. That's why she's, she's been wonderful. I'm I reading her thing. I have to. Yeah. She's in Portland. She is a cohort of Susanna Nickerson. She's a, oh, and Rebecca is a is a Nickerson herself, and she's really? in the Chatham band. In what band? The Chatham band, the bandstand band, Friday night band. And she was the advocate for saving one of the, or uh, one of the homes right on or buildings right on Main Street at Mahi Gold or next to it. Rebecca, yeah. All oh, right, right. Yeah. The um... the little antique shop and. Everything. She's amazing. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking, thinking she was somebody else. Is she going to get something for us or put a oh, light? Turn on the light. So she lives in Chatham. Mm -hmm. Lifelong, I believe. Mm -hmm. There you are, but we can't hear you. You're like you're muted or your volume isn't on on your computer. Put your fingers. There you go. There you are. No. No, nope, cannot hear you, Rebecca. She's frustrated now, I'm sorry. Sorry, but you've heard me sing your praises and attempt your... Wait a minute. I, wanna, I don't wanna leave her frustrated. How many did we have? 25. One board member and no creative team. Did she read that? I don't think she is muted though, because it would show. Oh, um, then she has to sound. It's her sound. Your, your you have a, isn't on. Rebecca. Can you text her? No. I don't um, know. She can hear us. Sound level? She can hear us. It's something okay. on your end, Rebecca. Sorry. Sound level. Can you turn your your sound up? Okay, Rebecca, I, I'm sorry to, to frustrate you. So we'll connect. I'm just happy to see your face. Yeah, and thank face you. Face for the name. Support. And we'll get we'll figure out a way to get together sometime. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Have a lovely Bye. evening. Bye. Bye. Ellen, I'll call you. Bye. Bye.